Good morning. Coach Slack here once again, continuing our readings on the Synaxarian, the lives of the saints of the Orthodox Church. On this day, the third day of October, we commemorate the Holy Hierarch Martyr Dionysius the Areopagite. Saint Dionysius, who came of a rich and noble family, lived in Athens at the time of the Apostles. On account of the wisdom and virtue pagan learning afforded him, he was chosen one of the nine counselors of the Areopagus, the high court and parliament of the city. As such, it was he who invited the great apostle Paul, whom the Holy Spirit had brought to the city, to proclaim the good tidings of salvation on the Areopagus. From the height of this rock overlooking the city, the simple tent maker pulled to pieces the sophistries of the Athenian philosophers and clearly showed that the unknown God, whom their unassisted reason had given them a vague notion of, was the Lord of heaven and earth, who made the world and everything in it, and who does not live in temples made by hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. He told them that man is made in the image of God and is called upon to share the divine life in the very Son of God, Jesus Christ, who has taken our flesh, has risen from the dead, and will come to judge the world. Most of the audience mocked St. Paul in hearing about the resurrection of the dead, since the false wisdom of this world had completely darkened their minds. Even so, the hearts of several among them, including St. Dionysius and St. Eretheos, were touched by these words of eternal life, and they believed. When St. Paul spoke of the Savior's passion and of the portents that occurred at his death, Dionysius recalled the solar eclipse, inexplicable to astronomers, that had happened years before when he was in Egypt, completing his studies among learned men at Heliopolis. Either God is suffering, he had cried out then, or this is the end of the world. This event prepared Dionysius and his master, Herotheos, to recognize him who overcomes the laws of nature when he so wills. So they listened eagerly to the holy apostle's teaching and asked him for baptism. After some time, St. Paul departed to endure new tribulations and left St. Herotheos as bishop of Athens. Like the eagle that can look directly upon the brightness of the sun, Herotheos was able to enter into the mysteries of God. But he wrote little, choosing rather to instruct his disciple Dionysius orally concerning the revelations beyond all speech that God granted him. On Herotheos' death, Dionysius became bishop of Athens in his stead. God enabled him by his grace to put into writing the sublime teachings of his masters about the unutterable boundlessness of the divine nature to which none but the negative terms of apophatic theology are applicable, and about the unfathomable riches of his revelation through his names and energies that is the sum of affirmative theology. He described how the sensible world, that perceived by our senses, and the intelligible world, that apprehended by the illumined intellect, are united to God in a magnificently ordered hierarchy. He explained how the hierarchy of the church from bishop to monk reproduced on earth the nine angelic orders and gave to each the divine light according to the degree of his purification. Some people have accused St. Dionysius of borrowing the terminology of Neoplatonic philosophers. But the Orthodox Church, enlightened by his divine teaching, believes that he used the philosophical language of his age while utterly reversing the fundamental theses of pagan philosophy. Employing this stratagem to show that the folly of cross has made foolish the wisdom of this world, throughout his writings he affirms that he who is beyond every name and all being and who dwells in the darkness more radiant than light has appeared in the flesh so as to make us partakers of his light. St. Dionysius attained such heights of divine contemplation that he was accounted worthy of being numbered among the apostles and was wondrously transported to Jerusalem for the entombment of the mother of God. On his return to Athens, he devoted himself for some time to converting the pagans and to guiding his spiritual flock. Toward the end of Nero's reign, he visited Rome to give his master, St. Paul, an account of his missionary activity. 
He was present at Paul's martyrdom and then returned to Greece. On a later visit to Rome, St. Dionysius and his disciples, the priest Rusticus and deacon Eleftherius, were commissioned by St. Clement, the bishop of Rome, to preach the gospel in Gaul. When he had preached the word of truth in a good many places, Dionysius settled in Paris, which was then a small town sunk in the darkness of ignorance and paganism. He built a church there in which he served the holy mysteries and proclaimed the great works of God. He worked many miracles so that in a while the number of his disciples increased, and they set out to spread the holy gospel in Britain and as far as Spain. The renown of St. Dionysius aroused the envy of the devil, who gave the emperor Domitian to understand that the Greek bishop who was preaching a new god was trying to provoke disorder and revolt. The imperial officers tried in vain to persuade Dionysius and his companions to deny God, for whom they lived and wished to die. And so, on being sentenced to beheading, the martyrs were overjoyed. Not only did God give the holy bishop the grace of knowledge and of teaching, but he also wanted to show in his martyrdom that, by faith, Christians have overcome death. So when Dionysius had been beheaded, he stood up to the amazement of all, took his head in his hands, and walked thus for two miles until he had met Catula, a, god, a godly woman, to whom he gave this precious relic. St. Dionysius' skull is now venerated in the monastery of Dohiru on Mount Athos, to which it was given by the emperor Alexius Comnenimus in the 11th century. There was a footnote here that I skipped over. <clears throat> I'll read it now. Dionysius's hierarchical dispositions thus express no degradation of the one, as is the case with the Neoplatonist, but rather the progressive manifestation of deifying grace and participation in God. The question of the identity of the author of the writings ascribed to St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, has been the subject of bitter disputes among the specialists. Lying behind this debate, is not so much simple historical information that is at stake, but more the recognition of these writings that church tradition has used as a basis for its spiritual theology. The author's identity has, in this case, more of an iconic function than a strictly historical one. Through the prayers of thy saints, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Amen.